good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Tudor Allen. I'm the archivist at Camden Local Studies and Archives Centre, and thank you for joining us for this evening's event. I'm delighted to introduce us tonight's speakers and performers, Melanie Hughes and Nadia Ostakini. Now, Melanie was educated at, and here my French pronunciation, or lack of it, is going to be tested, but I think it's the Lycée Internationale de Londres um, and trained at the Central School of Speech and Drama. She then went on to act in theatre, television and films. She began writing for Ken Russell on the TV series Lady Chatterley and then went on to work on further projects for him, for the BBC, for London Films and for Union Pictures. Her first book, was Mrs. Fisher's Tulip, and her most recent books are War Changes Everything and its sequel, Midnight Legacy. And our other uh, performer tonight, Nadia, was born in London of Italian parentage and graduated from University College London in Italian before training at the Academy Drama School. She's worked as a professional actress voiceover, artist, and corporate presenter. Her stage work has included several major national and international tours. She's also the artistic director and producer of Tricolore Theatre Company. And the subject of the next, of the next show will be intriguingly, Joseph Grimaldi, the father of modern clowning and the well-known novelist, Jane Austen. Well, drawing on the memoirs and archives of two remarkable women, Tonight's event will explore London's Italian quarter in the turbulent period between the two world wars, examining the impact of the warring ideologies of fascists and left-wing factions on individual lives. And just once again, uh, before we begin the event, could I kindly ask you just to ensure that you're on mute and that your cameras are switched off um, and again, there'll be a Q and A's after the event is finished. So if you have a question or comment, could you kindly save it until um, that uh, part of the evening? Many thanks. So without more ado, I'll pass you over to Melanie and Nadia. I'd like to, well, uh, to echo Tudor's welcome and thank you for attending the talk. And I hope you find it interesting. Now the past, that of your family or your community stands behind you always, be it a comfort, a support, an anchor, or even a burden. Either way, love it, ignore it, or embrace it. We're all of us the repository of our accrued past. It defines us. And nowhere was this more true than in the Italian community in London between the two world wars. This was a close-knit, caring community where the more successful members actively helped the less fortunate. In a patchwork of history and memoir, I want to give you a snapshot of the history of the times and of a community caught between two worlds. I want to give a, a, a glimpse of these times and the fascinating, often bitterly opposed characters that formed this vibrant community. But I do want to stress here that I am a writer, not a historian. And as such, as a writer, I had the immense good fortune to have access to a comprehensive and detailed family archive. And I've supported this with independent research. So although the readings that Nadia is going to do for us come from my novel, War Changes Everything, and I have changed names, the events and the people in the book were real. So, caught between two worlds, Two very different worlds, Italy and England. Two ideologies, two cultures, two sets of mores. Now the Italians in London in the main just sought to make a good living, work hard, support their community and care for their families. But there were others among them who had a broader ambition and they had a varied and profound impact on the world of ideas and political thought. These two decades, in between the two wars, the 20s and the 30s, were a time of profound change. 
In the aftermath of the First World War, there was a widespread feeling that, as George Orwell put it, the world's gone wrong. The old order had broken, and the younger generation who had fought in the slaughter of the trenches had borne the brunt of it. Those who survived were bitter and angry, as the writings of Orwell and Hemingway clearly show, and they were crying out for a new order. There'd never been a wider gulf between the generations, between those who'd promoted the war and those who'd suffered it. The returning soldiers who had fought for a better world felt they'd been lied to. As even Kipling put it, if any question why we died, tell them, was because our fathers lied. The generals had lied about the human cost of the war. The politicians lied about its course and a compliant press had hushed up its horrors. So this disillusion and alienation gave rise to the longing for a new status quo, a new world to replace the decaying empires that had started this carnage. One that would reflect the new post-war reality with for the first time the emergence of youth as a political power War always brings around huge social change. And in this period, Collette said, youth is now at the helm. And this new order manifested itself in many different forms. From the communists who looked to the new Soviet Union as a modern utopia, to the fascists led first by Mussolini in Italy, who embraced the notion of man as an idealized warrior, a new Roman, who would build a third Roman Empire. And these ideas of Mussolini were eagerly taken up by one Adolf Hitler in Germany with his deification of the perfect Aryan and his vision of the thousand year Reich. The politics in these years between the wars were fiercely polarized. The fascists regarded the left as criminals and traitors and the left felt pretty much the same about the right. Nowhere was this more apparent than in the Piazza del Popolo in Rome, where the warring factions of left and right set up opposing camps in two cafes on opposite side of the square, and as the evening went on, spilled out onto the street and went from yelling insults at each other to fist and knife fights in the middle of the square, as Hemingway documented. So how did this turbulence affect the Italian community in London. The polarity in Italy was swiftly reflected here. By 1931, 29,000 Italians lived in Britain, of whom 20,000 had been born in Italy. London was the largest community, with around 15,000 Italians who lived and worked in the Clerkenwell and Soho districts. They were hardworking and enterprising, Many started their own businesses, mostly in catering and shopkeeping, importing Italian wines and foodstuffs and introducing Italian cuisine to a wider clientele in restaurants and cafes. The Baroni family in my book were very much a part of this community, as we see from this reading. The Baroni family lived in a tall, narrow house in Mornington Crescent, they were a talking, laughing family with a cast of rotating cousins. Papa Baroni owned a business in Soho, supplying pasta, olive oil and salamis to West End hotels and restaurants. It was all very unusual at that time. What is commonplace now on our supermarket shelves was then peculiar and rare. The exotic was viewed with suspicion foreign was practically a term of abuse. I met Yolanda Baroni on my first day at school. We were scholarship girls at the Godolphin and Latimer School. What's your name, love? The dinner lady asked as she dolloped a huge amount of cottage pie on my plate. Juanita? Blimey! How'd you come by a name like that? Sounds more like a musical turn. <laughs> she laughed 
and t- turned to the girl behind me in the queue. And you, sweetheart, Yolanda Baroni. Crikey! We got the old circus here today. The girls around us laughed. I took my plate and sat down at an empty table in the corner of the vast dining hall, as far from the others as I could get. A plate was banged down on the table. Budge up. It was her, so I obeyed it. Take no notice, they're idiots. She sat down beside me. I dared a peep. It was the girl from the queue. She had glossy raven hair and satiny olive skin. She tried a mouthful of pie. Putrid, isn't it? Pig swill, I call it. I don't think I dared to laugh. She pushed her plate away, then went on briskly. Your name's Juanita. It's the only name in this place that's as foreign as mine. She held out her hand. Yolanda Baroni. You could see her point. I'm Italian. You must be Spanish. We shook hands. We'd better stick together. Latins and all. <laughs> Contramundum. Talk about Eilis and Gaza. She paused as if considering our fate. Then she put her elbows on the table and began to talk. Yolanda may have been only 12, but she had style and a kind of robust courage, a willingness to swim against the tide I came to admire and love. We did stick together. We became best friends. In 1921, the London Fashion was the first fascist newspaper to be created outside of Italy. The weekly newspaper of the London community, L'Eco d'Italia, was bought by Fascio in 1926, and its name changed to L'Italia Nostra. So you can see the way things are going. The voice of Italy is ours. And the communist paper of the time was called Il Comento. Both these papers reported their own widely different view of the news with comments from Italy and reviews of Italian books, films, and radio programs. From the very start, Fascio had a proselytizing tone, seeking to recruit for the fascist cause and portray Mussolini's Italy as the only vision, the only true new Italy. And in their eyes, there was no no patriotism without fascism. In other large cities where the Italian community existed, Glasgow, Liverpool, and Manchester, Fascio founded satellite organizations and sought to convert all Italians into fascists. It became a tragic irony that their degree of success was made possible by the fact that Italians in the UK had a very long and strong tradition of helping each other. And this was particularly so in the Clerkenwell area known as Little Italy, as Cavalli calls it, a fragment of the faraway fatherland, which was run then like an Italian village. Social, religious and family ties were very strong, based on an inclusive hospitality and a real generosity in helping others. By 1920, the community had a church, St. Peter's, a school, very active mutual aid societies, and even its own hospital in Queen Square. And St. Peter's Church was a social as well as religious hub for the community. This open-hearted generosity extended not merely to recreational and religious matters, but also to real practical help. As Elena Salvoni, who was later on the manageress of the famous Quo Vadis restaurant wrote, fathers would look around and find among their friends and associates a good employer for their sons and daughters and the sons and daughters of their friends. And help was not only with jobs, any legal, personal or business problems, from writing letters home for the illiterate to representation at tribunals and courts were dealt with within the community, giving all a real sense of belonging 
and Olive Bassani's really excellent book, A Better Life, illustrates this vividly. We see more of this from the next reading. My world, although still grey, was opening out. But what truly flooded my horizon with light was Yolanda. She brought colour and verve into my life and a bright breezy insouciance that was so that was as foreign as it was welcome. We met often, walking round London for hours, but always ending up at the Baroni's home. I loved it. It was full of life and laughter. The sullen, terrified silences of my home had no place there. The Baronis had fun together. They yelled and fought often. Sudden angry squalls that would erupt like a summer storm and die down just as quickly. But then they made up and, and loved each other with a fierce, possessive passion that astonished and enthralled me. Everything they did was was loud and colourful. Bright silks were draped over their furniture and windows. Opera was played constantly on a scratchy wind-up gramophone, not with church-like reverence, but with real love and familiarity. It was sung along to, sending great ballooning waves of music throughout the whole house. Books were read and handed around rarely put back in their, in their bookcase, but, but left out at the ready for the talks and rows that would ensue. The careless largesse of their lives made me feel giddy at first, almost drunk. And indeed it was, it was in their house that I sipped my first glass of wine and tasted olives and garlic. Mama B, as everyone, <laughs> even me eventually called her, was very kind. The first time I met her, standing in the doorway, afraid to come in and, and frozen with shyness, she seemed to sum me up at a glance, reading the truth of my life far more accurately in my silence and averted gaze than anything I could or, or would have told her. She smiled at me and her smile flowed over me like balm. I had told Yolanda the truth right from the start, knowing instinctively that she could handle anything but lies. So I, I confessed with shame that I was illegitimate and that my stepfather hated me so much he hit me often. Shocked, she, she, she told her mother, Stop, Yolanda, stop right there. Mama wiped her hands and moved to chop the herbs waiting on the draining board. I am a Catholic. Don't tell me anything that will force me to hurt her. She brandished her mezzaluna like a weapon. But Mama, she began chopping vigorously. I don't want to hear it. Huh? What I don't know can't hurt her. I have a feeling that child has been hurt too much, too much already. She, be she turned away and that was it. Discussion over. Yolanda told me all of this and then added at the end that sometimes her mama drove her nuts. I think she expected me to commiserate. But I knew that Mama Baroni knew exactly what I was and, and that she'd never let that knowledge hurt me. Oh, she was a devout Catholic. Crucifixes? Madonnas and, and statues of Jesus were to be found in every nook and niche of her home. But prayer formed the foundation of her life, not the bars around it. Yolanda taught me that the most important lesson of my life. She taught me never to be ashamed of being different. Her family taught me something else something that was to define my future. They showed me that there was a world outside the one I knew, a bigger, brighter world, full of colour and excitement. 
and better still, a, a life full of emotions they were not afraid to feel and, and ideas they were eager to explore. The Baroni family took me to their hearts and they were the first real joy in mine. Now this tolerant exclusiveness, inclusiveness changed in 1932 with the appointment of one Dino Grandi as Italian ambassador to London. He was a committed fascist with a mission to defend Italianista in the past and the present. And he did this by insisting that key positions within the community could only be held by fascists. Before this, Italian schools abroad were run by the church and the Dante Alighieri Society, often in competition with each other. At the same time, one of the founders of Fascio newspaper, Camillo Pellizzi, who was a lecturer in Italian at University College London, was appointed president of the Dante Alighieri Society. And by 1934, all teachers in all Italian schools outside of Italy were to be appointed and vetted by the Italian Foreign Office, thereby ensuring that teachers were now political tools, as well as educators, instructing their pupils with fascist propaganda. This effective infiltration and control also extended to the health and fitness movement, which was terribly popular at this time. They espoused military style uniforms and went in for march pasts with a right arm extended, fist clenched in the fascist salute. Elena Salvoni attended the Italian school and she was also sent to a camp near Felixstowe, held in a house owned by Dr. Rampagna, a fervent fascist, who was the doctor to many Italians in Clerkenwell. The first Mussolini camp was opened in Maidstone in 1933, where it was announced that the children there were now called to a new life. Thus, summer camps for the children provided childcare for the children of working parents, with indoctrination on the side, often during the long summer holidays and educational trips to Italy reeled in <laughs> adults. Thus, Fascio and Grandi's aim to rally Italians in London and the provinces to the fatherland in case of need was largely achieved, leaving the community in a wretched place when World War II was declared and they became enemy aliens in their adopted country and subject to internment and prejudice. The church in London was in the main co-opted into the fascist ideal, although in Italy itself, courageous attempts to resist were made. In London, there was little evidence of any such discord. Italians abroad, as well as at home, were to be made into good fascists through infiltration of all social, cultural and religious activities. Community cohesion was strengthened through good works and social activity, such as improvements made to the Italian hospital in London, talks, lectures and musical evenings were held. Films were shown. All aspects of Italian life were shown and supported, provided they kept to the fascist ideal. A nostalgic longing for the homeland was encouraged in all of the above, together with the books and articles and magazines and used newspapers. However, Fascio did comment on the difficulty of converting to the cause those Italians who had been born in the UK. They complained that this undisciplined approach equaled dis disloyalty to the fatherland. Perhaps they had Vero Ricchioni in mind, of him more later. Everything was griced to the fascist mill. The solid support received by the creation of new festivals entitled Befana Fascista and Natale di Roma, even the traditional epiphany, an occasion for gifts for children, was transformed and politicized as Grandi sought to mold youth into the living symbol of the Italy of tomorrow. From November 1933 onwards, Fascio called for collaboration with the British Union of Fascists under the leadership of Oswald Mosley, 
despite Mussolini's policy of not interfering in local politics abroad. Italian fascists in London ignored this, however, and maintained close ties with the BUF, even giving them financial support. Visits to each other's offices took place often, and they both took part in each other's public events. But as early on as 1935, Grandi was becoming disillusioned with Mosley. He felt he was not an effective leader and had made very little impact, despite his contacts with the highest in the land and the use of his first wife's immense fortune. When in 1936, after the fiasco of the fascist march through the largely Jewish part of the East End, when the local residents trounced both the black shirts and the Metropolitan Police who turned up to defend the black shirts in the Battle of Cable Street, both Mussolini and Grandi, quite reasonably, regarded Mosley as a busted flush, arguing that if a mob of untrained, undisciplined Jews and Irish, not groups they thought very well of, could make the black shirts run for their lives, then they weren't much of a fighting force and highly unlikely to pull off a coup d'etat. Mosley pleaded and then sulked, and then he ran away to Germany to console himself with Hitler. The London community then wisely concentrated on themselves, although there was now increasing tension between those who supported the fascists and those who did not, as, as we shall see. As the 30s went on, Yolanda, to her family's disquiet, became increasingly left-wing. She was outraged when the Labour Party adopted a policy of neutrality towards Spain as Franco, armed to the teeth by Hitler and Mussolini, marched on Madrid and she became distraught at what Mussolini was doing in her beloved Italy, becoming the friend and champion of those few Italian dissidents who had managed to make it to exile in London. The focal point of all anti-fascist feeling in London was Riccioni's food store in Old Compton Street, King Bomba it was called. Riccioni was an old family friend and business associate of the Baronis. Papa B was one of his major suppliers, importing the wines and olive oil from Luca that had made them both rich and respected. Riccioni hated Mussolini so much so that he had even funded two assassination attempts in the 1920s. When he died, his son took up the mantle and the shop became a meeting place and refuge for all Italian left-wingers. Vera Ricchioni was a great friend of Yolanda's. He was one of the few to see the significance of the Spanish Civil War and together they published the first weekly newspaper devoted to its coverage. However, Yolanda's views caused ructions within the Baroni's family. Ructions which, as ever, erupted at the dinner table. Papa had sympathised with his old partner, prophesying darkly that Mussolini would do no good, do, would do Italy no good in the long run. But he would or could not take action against his fellow Italians, fearing perhaps for the, his business and and Yolanda castigated him for sitting on the fence. She quarrelled openly with her younger brother, Carlo. Her older brother, Vittorio, was too busy helping Papa with the business. He went to and fro to Italy, recounting all that he had seen and, and clearly shocked by a lot of it. But like Papa, he refused to become politically involved. Carlo backed the fascists. He thought they were entirely a good thing and would make Italy great again. And so mealtimes became battlegrounds and no amount of placating or cajoling from the rest of us could prevent it. Mussolini may not be a great leader, he conceded at one of them, holding out a rare olive branch. His sister snorted, but he will make Italy great. A whole orchestra of protest from a dismiss dismissive sniff from Papa, an operatic no from Mama, to a howl of derision from Yolanda, 
greeted that remark. But look, Victoria looked at me and raised his eyes to heaven. He had been hoping for a quiet family dinner. Carlo, Yolanda now spoke softly, silkily, her tone caressing his wounded ego, while her words went straight for the jugular. Carlo, for once in your life, think. Hmm? You must have a brain in there somewhere. And she struck her forehead forcefully with a flat of her hand. Carlo was beside himself. He started to stammer. All I want is... is... <sighs> she raised her eyebrows in query with insulting politeness. It's for Italy to be great again. Don't you? What kind of Italian are you? A good one, darling. Huh? He wants us to live up to the glories of our tradition. The home of Da Vinci and Mazzini. Not the jackboot and the thug. It wasn't fair. He hadn't a hope. Choking with rage, Carlo banged his wine glass down on the table, sending a shower of blood red drops all over Mama's pristine lace tablecloth. She groaned, oh! But before she could open her mouth, the battle went on. You're just the dreamer, Yolanda. A silly little girl with big ideas. But you dream only of the past. Old Duce dreams of the future. Yolanda leaned in for the kill. His dream, Carlo, will become Italy's nightmare. Carlo glared at his sister, all his arguments exhausted. Mama and Papa sighed. Will they ever agree about anything? Mama asked wearily as she began to collect the plates. No, Cara, I don't think so, Papa replied. We have brought Cain and Abel into the world. Mama looked miserable as she left the room and Yolanda sat silently, defiant but shaken. These encounters always left her bereft, loathing as she did everything that Carlo believed in, but loving him just the same. She knew these were not like their past rows, bloody but soon forgotten. She said nothing more, but her eyes glittered with tears. Now the left wing at this time was also active but in the main was much less effective, largely because the groups were so fragmented and they were often at war with each other, but also to be fair, because they were by definition internationalist, and so they tended to become subsumed into larger international groups. But there are two larger than life characters that deserve mention. The influence they held was far greater than a narrow political one, because although their views were extreme and certainly not shared by the wider community, their care for the community and their desire to serve it was broad based and their influence was a far reaching one. They were a father and son. The father, Emidio Recchioni, was born in Ravenna in 1864. A committed anarchist, he had founded and edited a weekly newspaper which published Malatesta's manifesto. He was accused of being involved in a bomb plot in Ancona and served two years in jail. On his release, he founded another newspaper. So he was arrested and back went right back to jail. When he was finally released in 1899, he came to London and after working as a shop assistant in 1909, he opened the Italian grocery in Old Compton Street, King Bomber. This rapidly became a haven for Italian exiles and political activists, and later attracted a widespread group of writers, artists, and intellectuals. Intele Emidio is, is a very interesting and contradictory character. He had two great gifts. He had a great gift for making friends, and he had a great gift for making money because this revolutionary was a great businessman. 
the shop became legendary for being the first manufacturer of pasta in the UK and for introducing a whole range of Italian produce, canned tomatoes, salami, cheeses, olives, olive oil, fine wines, to a wide market in the UK. And the excellence of his wares earned him the custom not only of Italian exiles longing for the produce of home, but a broad clientele of many upmarket restaurants and hotels, the Savoy among them. Thus, Emidio became not merely a hugely successful businessman, but a pioneer who brought about a change in taste that has radically altered British habits of cooking and eating. The one-time jailbird and revolutionary came to be regarded as a pillar of the establishment, a philanthropist, in short, a reformed character. Mm. Well, in fact, he did not abandon his beliefs at all. Profits from the shop and importing businesses, by now he was also importing marble and granite from Carrara, went to financing political activities and publications and helping exiled Italians and always the wider Italian community. All those who fell on hard times were never turned away. He married and had two children, and the family, despite its wealth and position, lived very modestly over the shop. With the rise of fascism in Italy, Emilio broadened his scope, supporting anti-fascist movements not only here in London, but also in Italy, New York, and Buenos Aires. By the 1920s, he was funding the paper Il Commento, and he was almost certainly the guiding light behind the Italian League for Human Rights in London. In 1924, when Comento folded, Emidio, with other banned left-wingers and activists, set up a secret group to inspire resistance to Mussolini's regime. By the end of the 20s and the beginning of the 30s, he took it still further, becoming heavily involved in several attempts on Mussolini's life. In 1930, he acquired a British passport, hoping to avoid extradition and suspicion both in the UK and his travel abroad. But by this time, he was this hugely respected figure, which took the spotlight right off him and fooled most in the special branch that he was this reformed character. However, one Superintendent O'Brien was rightly convinced that Emilio was very far from that and knew he was actively involved in opposition to Mussolini and recently released reports do indicate a quite serious level of collusion between the special branch and the Mussolini regime. Now, at first, O'Brien's suspicions were dismissed out of hand by the permanent undersecretary at the Home Office. However, Carter of the special branch managed to link Emidio to a failed attempt on Mussolini's life. These revel revelations were published in the Daily Telegraph. As a result of this article, fascist thugs turned up at the King Bomber shop and threatened to kill Emilio, torch his premises, and murder his entire family. Emilio sighed, pulled a gun on them, told them he was an old and successful hand at political assassination, and they should go away and grow up. And he must have spooked them because they did run away, but Emilio was never without his gun again. The Italian community, now heavily under the influence of fascism, denounced Emidio in its publications and avoided his shop and boycotted his businesses. He was thus brought to the verge of bankruptcy. He was never one to take things lying down, so he took out a writ of libel against the Daily Telegraph, and to the astonishment of everyone, especially his barrister, he actually won. He was awarded the sum of 1,177 pounds, three shillings and sixpence, which was a considerable sum in those days. And the reason that he was awarded this was that acting on the, uh, when the Daily Telegraph appealed to the special branch to corroborate the article, they flatly refused to. They were uh, acting under the direct instructions of the police commissioner who'd been informed that the 
prime minister of the day, Ramsay MacDonald, who presided over a very shaky coalition government, was a close personal friend of Emilio Recchioni. And that if it were to become public knowledge that the prime minister of England was a friend of this rather dodgy Italian character who went in for political assassination, it could cause the government to fall. So it was hushed up and Emilio won. He was further involved in two other assassination plots against Mussolini, but in 1934 in Paris, he died in the course of an operation on his throat, mourned by his friends and colleagues in the Italian community, together with an impressive collection of prominent writers and intellectuals, including George Orwell, Sylvia Pankhurst, Bertrand Russell, and of course, Ramsay MacDonald. Emilio was a colorful and extraordinary character, a man of dogged beliefs and huge generosity. He changed many people's lives and his influence still lingers today in those of us in this country who enjoy Italian wines and cuisine. His son was Vero Recchioni, who was born in London in 1915. He pretty much imbibed politics in his mother's milk. Brought up in an atmosphere of fevered political debate and activism, he became, if anything, an even more committed activist than his father. He was educated at the Emmanuel Cox School in Wandsworth and graduated in civil engineering from King's College London in 1936. He was single-minded, dedicated and extremely difficult. Unlike his father, very few of his former friends and colleagues were on speaking terms with him at the time of, at the time of their deaths. By 1934, he was already becoming active in the battle against Mussolini. In 1935, his activities caused him to be deported from France, where he had met the Italian anarchist Camillo Berneri and fallen in love with his daughter, Marie Louise. In London, desiring anonymity and refuge from the constant death threats he received, he changed his name to Vernon Richards. In collaboration with Berneri in Paris, he began publishing Free Italy, Italia Libera, he was a close friend of Yolanda Baroni, one of the key characters in Melanie's book. And with clear-sighted vision, they became among the very few who saw the significance of the Spanish Civil War in 1936, realizing that it was not only a fight for freedom, but that it, that it was also a presage of things to come. They published the first English newspaper to cover the war from the anarchist point of view. He clearly saw the threat a united fascist Europe would pose to the world. And despite police, police harassment and threats to his personal safety, he was not afraid to spell it out in print. Vero never minded how tatty or makeshift the publications were. It's the words that matter, was his constant cry. And this desire this need to share information he thought important remained his guiding light for all of his life. He was also, by this time, running the family businesses based at King Bomba in Old Compton Street, and in fact, did so until the 1950s. In 1937, Marie Louise joined him in London, where to give her, where, to give her citizenship they married. She and their baby, however, died in childbirth in 1949. So, a fearless publisher and activist, but not a popular guy. In spite of the fact that King Bomba remained a hub and a haven for Italian dissidents and an international group of intellectuals, writers and political activists. Vero remained a committed activist for all of his life, editing the anarchist paper Freedom, in all its pre-war and wartime variations into the 1960s. He died in 2001. So in this talk, through a juxtaposition of history and personal memory, the general with the particular, I've tried to shed a human angle on historical events and show the impact on individual lives. But it's obviously highly personal and subjective 
based for the most part on letters and diaries by those who lacked the luxury of an academic overview, but actually lived among and through these tumultuous years and events. Now, most in the Italian community in these difficult years didn't espouse the polarities that warred around them, seeking instead with diligence and flair to honor and enjoy their original culture whilst playing a meaningful role within a new one, to live decent lives, provide for their families, care for the community. And mostly, they did it extremely well. But the community position during World War II was not an enviable one. Its good standing in the UK had taken a dent with Mussolini's invasion of Abyssinia in 1935. But with the declaration of war in 1939 and the subsequent entry of Italy into the war on the Axis side, things deteriorated rapidly, as we shall see. During the Blitz, Yolanda and I saw a lot of each other. We were both grass widows and we worked together. My husband was away most of the time and her boyfriend, a doctor, was on duty at the hospital round the clock. So she and, I, she and I would snatch a quick supper together most nights in town before the track north. She to her first aid post, me to my fire watching on the roof. Mostly it was the ABC or Joe Lyons in the Strand, but quite often a friend or business associate of the Baronis would offer us a delicious meal. As enemy aliens, Italians in London were, were now doing very badly. Papa B could no longer import his goods from Italy and was now living in semi-retirement. He and Mama P kept a low profile these days. Carlo, oh, he hardly dared go out anymore. Friends of theirs had had their brick, had had bricks thrown through their windows and abuse yelled at them in the street. Yolanda was particularly concerned about her elder brother, Vittorio. He had been born in Italy. Oh, she and Carlo were all right. They were born in London, and Papa B had had the foresight to make sure they were British citizens. But Mama, Papa, and Vittoria were not, and as enemy aliens, they could be rounded up and interned. Many were. Their wireless was confiscated, and they had to report to the police, local police station once a week, like criminals. Oh, they were anxious and afraid in a... And I hated to see them like that. One night, Yolanda and I went to a little restaurant in Soho, run by a cousin of her mother's. Nobody much was there, and we had the place to ourselves. We ate lovely spaghetti puttanesca and drank a special bottle of wine given us by the proprietor, Paolo. As he poured the wine, he sat with us and, and he told us the restaurant was now almost always empty that his friends and neighbours shunned him. He'd been threatened in the street and his son beaten up on the way home. He said that he had lived and worked in Soho for 40 years before any world war and, and now suddenly he was an enemy and an alien in the place he had called home. We sat talking for a long time and, and then Yolanda and I had to rush home as the sirens began to wail. So Italians in England were now pilloried and vilified as enemy aliens in the country where they had made their home. Winston Churchill, when asked in the House of Commons what should be done about these people, blithely declared, collar the lot, and they were rounded up and interned. No distinction was made between those who were politically active and those who never were. Many were interned on the Isle of Man and others were transported to Canada. In 1940, one of these transportation ships, the SS Arandora Star, was sunk in the Atlantic by a German U-boat with a horrific loss of 800 odd lives of whom 470 were Italian. And even after this, the deportation ships continued to cross the Atlantic, completely unescorted by convoy or escort ships to defend them. 
those who were interned in the UK were often treated like criminals, as has been described by Francesco Lorati in Olive Bessani's book. And some were even housed, if you can call it that, in the winter quarters of Bertram Mill's circus animals. In 1939, the children of the community were evacuated to the country with others, where so many faced prejudice and suspicion that their parents brought them back home to risk the bombs in London rather than the misery of their treatment in the country. And this is a sad and shameful note to end on. A community now literally caught between two worlds and during the Second World War, they suffered for it. Trapped between the Italian identity they had fought so hard to preserve and their adopted country between their traditional ties to their homeland and the need to form a new life in the UK. But what I'm left with in this personal study of the community in these years, and what I would like to celebrate and emphasize is the positive impact that Italian life and an inspirational culture brought to the UK in the drab, often closed world of England between the walls, the new ideas, the light and color, the generous embracing of thought and culture that is the hallmark of everything the Italian community has brought to and given the UK. It is a massive contribution, and I think it is very much worthwhile celebrating. Thank you. Well, um, a really big thank you to Melanie and Nadia for a wonderful hour. I learned so much from that and in such, such an enjoyable manner. It was a really lovely combination of history and drama. Melanie's knowledge and writing skills on the one hand combined with Nadia's evident acting talent. Bringing to life London's Italian community between the wars and during World War II and helping us to understand of how the politics of the time impacted on individual lives. So I really enjoyed that. Big thank you to Melanie and Nadia. I hope everybody agrees with me. And now